Good evening everyone. Uh, I want to just welcome you here to our evening service tonight. Um, this is our second such evening service in the time of lockdown. Um, as you notice, um, we're not in the church tonight and our evening service is going to be a little bit more informal. Um, tonight we're in Malayan, a sunny, glorious Malayan. So just imagine uh, the beaches out there, the, the waves are crashing down uh, and we are here to worship God. Um, but before we do so, um, it's important that we prepare our hearts to worship the one true God. And one of the ways that we, the most effective way of doing that is by meditating on scripture itself. You see, God has created us with a great connection with his word. See, it records in Genesis how mankind was God breathed. That God breathed into us and we were given life. And likewise, the scriptures, it says, is God breathed. And so it connects with us in a level like nothing else. And so just um, if, you, if you would just listen to the words of Psalm 25 with me. And allow these to be your prayer and your desire. Allow these to stir your heart to be able to worship your king. This is the word of God. Of David. To you, O God, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in the truth and teach me. For you are my God, O God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from my, of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For the sake of your goodness, O Lord. And may the Lord bless us in our need. And may the focus, may that focus our hearts as we come now to the Lord to pray. Let us pray. Dear Lord our God, we thank you that you are a God who can be known. And Lord, we, in the last few weeks, as we have been in lockdown and we have appreciated nature all around us in a new way. As we saw the sun illuminate your wonderful creation. And as we could see the, the beautiful skies, we are reminded of how all those declare your glory. Lord, how they stir us from deep with that desire that you have placed in us to worship you. But more than just reveal yourself in nature, you have more have give us special revelation in which we can know you, not just to know about you, but God, we thank you that through the words of Scripture that we can come into relationship with you, that we can know you more, that we can love you more and be conformed to the image your image more and more. God, we thank you for Jesus Christ. The one who is our great high priest. The one who hears our, the groanings of our hearts and brings them to the very throne room of heaven itself. God, we thank you that this time, well, maybe we feel isolated. Maybe we feel abandoned. And Lord, we know because of Jesus that you will never abandon us. But that you will guide your people. And so, Lord, we ask this evening that you would guide us in your ways. And you would allow us to add joy and a delight in them. Because Lord, if you know our hearts. And you know that often we don't delight in you. That we delight in so many other things. And God, this time of lockdown for many has exposed those sinful desires. But Lord, we ask that you will not remember our sins of old. And the transgressions that we bring before you. But Lord, that you would humbly hear our confession of sin. And that, Lord God, that you would wipe it away, that you would make it as white as snow, so that we may be renewed to continue to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
And last week uh, we were fortunate enough to have Reese leading us in worship and we are very fortunate in Scrabble to have so many people who are both willing and able uh, to lead us and, and serve the church in many ways. And tonight uh, Leah is going to lead us in some worship. Um, so please, wherever you are, uh, join in. Fill our, or fill our hearts, fill our rooms, fill our communities with the praise of God. to God's Word um, and we're going to continue on in our series in the book of Habakkuk. Uh, Habakkuk's a lesser known book of the Bible and um, it's, no, it's one of the minor prophets not because it is less significant than the major prophets but because of its size. Um, the prophets aren't ones which we maybe know as much of. They're quite difficult sometimes to, to get into um, but they're nonetheless nourishing for our soul. Um, and so we're going to read um, together from Habakkuk chapter 1 verses 12 to Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 1. And please if you do have a Bible, please if you could get it out and follow on or if you have your smartphone please look up and follow on, not just for the reading. But I'll be referring to it um, a number of times uh, as I preach. So please do feel that. Are you from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are purer eyes than to see evil and cannot do wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallow up the man more righteous than he? 
You will make mankind like the fish of the sea, like the crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet. So he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and makes offering to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look to see what he shall say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. May the Lord bless our reading to us. We're just going to take just a moment to still our hearts and ask God to prepare them as we receive the nourishment of God's word. Let us pray. Dear Lord our God, we thank you that your word is alive and that it is active. We thank you that it's a double-edged sword, that it cuts right to the bone. And so tonight, Lord, we pray that through your spirit, that you may encourage us or correct us or teach us in the ways of righteousness, that you may have your way in our hearts, and that through the seeds of the gospel planted, that we may be able to bear fruit of righteousness. God, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the areas of modern history that has greatly fascinated me over the years is the development of the United States of America, especially its checkered past with slavery. For, not, for in the not so distant past, most African Americans were born as slaves. And therefore, by law, they were regarded as mere possessions for their white masters to do whatever they wished with. For many of the slaves, life was horrendous. They could be maliciously beaten for any perceived misdemeanours. Their families could be torn apart by the selling off of their children to the highest bidder. Many were worked to their death and there was no, little or no prospect of change. You would expect it that for the vast majority they would have lived without hope. Yet remarkably in such communities the Christian faith flourished. And this wasn't just a naive faith which some people would later think of. This was not just a white man's religion to keep the black men down. No, this was a great and deep and rich faith which faithfully walked in the ways of God. It's no coincidence as you look at literature from, from that time period that often the black character had a Christian faith. In order for a faith to prosper and to grow under such circumstances, those slaves would have had to come to terms with life's difficulties and to submit to God's ways in the midst of those difficulties. For no doubt, many of those who had a Christian faith, they would have cried out for God to relieve their burdens. Yet for many, change was not on the horizon in this world anyway. If they couldn't come to terms with such questions, God would seem at best disinterested and at worst fatalistic. And if this was to grow uncheckered, it would lead to people wandering off in their relationship with God. And we too have to answer that very same question if we want to continue to grow in our faith. For all of us will have to answer those questions because all of us will have a time where we will be disappointed with the way God acts. That maybe God doesn't respond to our cries and prayers in the way that we think he should. And if you haven't faced a time like that in your life, you will. I guarantee it. And through the book of Habakkuk, we're going to see how we are to deal with disappointment with God. Last week, Arne shared about how the prophet came before the Lord to speak out against the injustices and the sheer scale of wickedness that was taking place in the holy city, Jerusalem. His complaint was pretty much like this. Why is there so much wickedness? God, you're not doing anything about it. Habakkuk maybe had grand plans that God would answer in some miraculous way. Maybe he hoped that God would send revival, that he would send a new king who would bring in reform like Josiah. 
where the Spirit of God would bring people back to him. Or at the very least, that the perpetrators would be disciplined. However, God's plan must have shook Habakkuk to his core. Something he would never have imagined that would ever happen. But in verse 5 to 12, God did assure Habakkuk that the wicked would be judged. But he made it clear that that would be Judah. And that Judah would be judged with the wrath of Babylon. That was a shocking message for all those who must have heard that first time. Maybe to help us to imagine that ourselves. Imagine that God raised up the Russian Empire, or the, the Russia and its military might to be against a small nation like Northern Ireland. To make things worse, Habakkuk knew that Babylon were as bloodthirsty as they were powerful, known for their barbarity and their wickedness. Habakkuk's question now twi- switches to God, how can you use this wicked nation to judge your people? Behind such a question, no doubt, was deep disappointment with God. How did God respond in such a way? I'm sure all of us have felt like Habakkuk at some stage. You know where we have poured our hearts to God? That we have asked and we have maybe even got other people to ask on our behalf. But then things didn't pan out how we thought they should. Whether that's a family member who was sick and we prayed, but they only got worse. Or maybe it's a relational breakdown and we prayed that God would restore it. Only for it to deteriorate to the point of breaking. Or maybe we, we have prayed that our that we would get relief from depression. Only for it to become steadily more debilitating and, and even crippling. How do you respond when things don't turn out the way they should? How do you respond when God doesn't answer the prayers in the way that you think they should? Well, Habakkuk, in response to, to God and God's plan here, turns to the Lord. To deal with disappointments with God, we need to acknowledge who God is in prayer. By acknowledging who he is. Some of us, when we don't get our own way, we have a tendency to withdraw, to huff. To go away from other people. And sometimes that, is it, that impacts how we come to God. And so when we are disappointed with God, we withdraw from him. Yet Habakkuk wisely reminds us that that is the worst thing that we can do. That in times of difficulty, in times of frustration, that we must come directly before the Lord. And as we do so, we must first realign ourselves to who we know God is. That's what Habakkuk wisely does in the first few verses of his complaint. In fact, so concentrated is his acknowledgement of who God is that within those first and a half, he names six different characteristics of God. Lord, everlasting, my God, my Holy One, Lord and Rock. And these six things help to focus and help to pair us before we come before the Lord with our complaints, with our frustrations. He begins by asking, are you not the everlasting? O Lord, my God, my Holy One. In times of difficulty, it can be hard for us to get a true perspective. It seems like our troubles are insurmountable, that we will never be able to get through them. That there's no good that will come of them. Yet wisely here the prophet broadens his gaze by remembering who he comes before in prayer. That God is the everlasting God. That he is the eternal one. But that's not the only connotations that Habakkuk's getting at here. You see, that also was you that language was used to speak of God's covenantal care to protect his people. It echoes to what was said in Deuteronomy 33, where it said, The eternal God is our refuge. And underneath, 
are the everlasting arms. He will drive out the armies before you, saying destroy. Here the prophet is reminding God of the promises that he has made to sustain and protect his people. Yet Habakkuk remembers that this covenantal care is established in a personal relationship. We see that as he continues, my Lord, my God, my Holy One. It emphasises that Yahweh is their gods, that they are his people, he, they are his special possessions. We are not only to remember who God is as we pray, but who we are in relation to God. That we are not strangers, but that he is our God. He then goes on to describe God as being a rock. And here he's reminded, he's been reminded that God is the great unchangeable. The one who is just and good and perfect in all his ways. Finally in verse 13, he acknowledges God's pure, absolute purity and, and hatred of sin. I think this is really important for us because often as we come to pray, we already in our minds feel like we already have the perfect solution, don't we? God, do it this way. But as we acknowledge who God is, it realigns us and helps us to remember that we are not God. That we are all not all-knowing. That we are not eternal. But as we come to the one who is, may he focus us on him. And that's the first step if you, you're disappointed in, with God. Or you feel let down by God. It is to go directly to him. That may not be easy. Folks, there's times where we will be so raw that we feel like we can't even go to God. That it may be a great strain to come before him that it will be painful. Yet nonetheless, endeavour to come directly to God in faith. But as you do so, remember who you address. This is not coming before another businessman or someone in your family. But this is coming before the Lord. And so we must do it in reverence. Just like the prophet Habakkuk, also the prophet Job. Acknowledge who God is. Even when there's parts of his character that we are struggling with now, nonetheless, hold on to them. Acknowledge them. Allow them to guide your prayers. And use the focus before we pour out our hearts directly to him. To deal with disappointments with God, we need to acknowledge who he is in prayer. Habakkuk now comes on to the main part of his argument in verses 13 to 17, where he lays out his complaints before God. After all that he has said about God and and the situation which he sees in front of him, Habakkuk struggles to square off who God says he is and the situation that's unfolding. Although God is pure and holy and cannot see wrong, the prophet looks round and sees God's pronouncement against Judah as God standing idly by in the face of wickedness. Although Habakkuk knows God is a perfect judge, the prophet sees God's Silence as condoning the wicked. The whole thing seems so unfair to Habakkuk. How could God use those wicked Babylonians to judge God's people? So he pours out his heart before God in this complaint. Much in the same way as the psalmist tells us to do in Psalm 62 verse 8. Trust in the Lord at all times, you people. Pour out your heart to him. For God is our refuge. To deal with disappointments with God, we must pour our hearts to God in faith and humble submission. It may seem like the prophet here is not indeed trusting the Lord, as he delivers what we would only describe as a rant. However, we have to remember that there's a massive difference between doubt and unbelief. Here, by acknowledging who God is and bringing those very doubts and fears before the Lord, Habakkuk is indeed being faithful. He is trusting God not only with a part of himself, but no part 
of his life or thinking or thoughts. It's off limit in his relationship with God. However, we'll see later that he does so with a humble spirit of submission, even in spite of those frustrations which almost bubble over, to deal with disappointments with God. We must pour out our heart before him in faith and humility. Habakkuk then proceeds to lay out his case against God's justice. And it's a, quite a comprehensive case at that. The next few verses, although it's a little bit of confusion, is speaking of the Babylonians. It uses the imagery of a fisherman because that was the symbolism that was used in Babylon itself to declare its great military might. Habakkuk then lists nine objections against the ensuing Babylonian judgment. The first three objections, they concern the abuses of the Babylonians. The fourth and fifth concern their joy that they seem to get out of their wickedness. The sixth and seventh to their idol worship. And their eighth and ninth to the gains that they seem to have because of their wickedness. At the heart of Habakkuk's wrestling with God in verse 13b, this. Why do you idly look at, tra at traitors and remain silent and swallow up the man who is more righteous than he? He looks out and he says, God, as bad as we are, we're not as bad as the Babylonians. And indeed, that, that was probably true. Yet we must not forget that the people of God constantly had been turning away from God to idols. But behind such a question, we, we see a similar question from uh, the contemporary of Habakkuk, the prophet Jeremiah, who in chapter 12 said this, Why did the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? See, in times of difficulty, we have a tendency not only to look inwards, but look out. And that, and to look at that age-old question, why do the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer? It's be hard not to get into that frame of mind, can't it? Maybe we've lost a loved one. Only for to see other people who have gone on to recover and continue on in the life of crime. Maybe we see other people live to a ripe old age in spite of them abusing their body. When you have looked after your body your whole life, you have crippling pain. We see the dishonest prosper while those who are honest struggle. And this only confounds our sense of difficulties and injustices and can make our blood boil. But that's not the only reason why Habakkuk is struggling to get his head around this. Because he knows what this means. Not only for him but the whole people of God. He knows that there will be great suffering for God's people. He knows that they're going to go through a time of great darkness that they've never seen before. He knows that this pain will touch every single one of their hearts. That no one will escape these difficulties. And for many, that pain will not be relieved this side of eternity. And often we are, find ourselves in the very similar situations. We go through situations and it seems that there will be nothing in this world which can alleviate the pain that we go through. To deal with disappointments with God, we must pour out our heart in prayer by faithfully submitting to him passage that we've read is a dark one isn't it it's full of disappointment and frustration of what god's done and indeed what god hasn't done it can make difficult reading that's why we find it so hard sometimes to delve into prophets however it's not devoid of hope and that hope is the thing that is vital for the prophet and indeed all of us to be sustained through difficulties it's a tiny glimmer of hope which seems to just penetrate through though the darkness is all encompassing. One man, someone once said, man can live 
or find food for 40 days. About three days without water. About eight minutes without air. But only one second without hope. It was hope that enabled them black slaves to be able to continue serving the Lord, even though in this life they would go through pain after pain. It was hope that enabled Christians in North Korea to en endure years of solitary confinement in prison for their faith. And it's that very same hope that enabled Habakkuk to continue to walk faithfully in the Lord, even in this time of silence. Even in this time where he didn't know exactly what God would do. And that hope is found, it's quite obscure in this passage, but indeed it is there. I, I see that hope in verse 12. Where Habakkuk says, we shall not die. See, I think Habakkuk here is remembering God's promises. And he knows as he hears about this ensuing darkness, as he sees that the difficult days will be ahead for the people of God, that they will go through the darkest days in the history of the nation, that God has promised to sustain his remnant. That they will not be wiped out like Sodom and Gomorrah had in past centuries, but through the strength of the Lord they will be restored again as his people. And that was the hope of the prophets. And that needs to be our hope too. That God will come and he will protect his remnant and he will raise us up again. Remember that God had chosen them. And God has also chosen us. And redeemed and purchased us through the blood of his son Jesus Christ. And, it is, and because we are purchased it says that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Guys, so often in difficulty, we feel we, that God has abandoned us. But remember that we were bought at cost. And that God will not leave us. That he will not abandon us, even though the difficulties may go on from day to day. And may never clear in this world. May that be a great glimmer of hope. Even if you feel like you're in a situation of great darkness. Even if the darkness seems to encompass you and you can see no way out. That God still is with you. That God will not leave you through that. That God will strengthen you and pr preserve you to the very end. We may never see the working out of that situation. That was the case for Habakkuk's people. They would suffer unbelievably. The Babylonians indeed would come. They would destroy Jerusalem. They would exile much of the nation. Many would die. And those who didn't die were taken in captivity away from their families to live in Babylon. However, in spite of that great pain that they would go through, the remnant would indeed be sustained. We see the truth of Psalm 30 verse 5. Weeping may tar for the night. But joy comes in the morning. See, they would go through the tar of the night. But one day there would be joy and the deliverance and redemption. Although Habakkuk wasn't able to see that at this point, in spite of that, he was able to faithfully walk, silently walk with God. To follow him faithfully until God's redemption came. And that's very much what we see in Habakkuk's attitude in chapter 2 verse 1. Again, it, it can be easily lost on us. He says, I will, I will take my stand at the watchtower and station myself on the tower. And I will look to see what he says. See, the watchtower was where people were to go to make sure if the enemy was coming. But also it was a place where they were to see if, if help was to come also. And this was symbolic for prophets. Prophets were told to be watchmen. They were to be representatives of the people. They were to perpetually be praying for the people. They were to be sharing the words of judgment, but also looking for words of deliverance from the Lord. They were to stand in the gap between the, the people and God and intercede on their behalf. And here, in spite of his frustrations, in spite of his disappointment, Habakkuk chooses to continue to walk in the ways which God has commanded. And indeed, even though darkness was in the, all around him, 
he chose to wait for the Lord and to wait for his deliverance. And we too need to do that. In those times where we don't feel that there will be any relief, that we need to continue to be faithful in God. Because there will be times where there will be no solutions to the difficulties that we go through. There will be times where things don't work out as we should. There will be times where there will be a deep pain within our hearts that will never go away. Yet as believers, our hope is not just of this world. We have a much greater hope than that. We have a hope for eternity more. And Jesus himself, he used this image of the watchman and said, as believers, as all people should be ready for this news of deliverance and judgment. See, he was alluding to the fact when he would come again, he would not come in humiliation as he did the first time as he died, but he would come in victory. He would come to restore all things to him. He would come to rule over his people, to banish evil and death and wickedness and injustices and that he would reign forevermore. For those who are his people, all those disappointments, all those difficulties, all those frustrations will be gone and our sufferings will not be worth comparing to the joy that we will have in Christ Jesus forevermore. So brothers and sisters, if you are in that place today, if you are feeling that God has let you down, bring it before him by acknowledging who he is. Pour out your heart in humble submission and continue to walk with him each day, even when in the silence, even when there is little hope on the horizon. Hope in Jesus. I just want to conclude just with the words of Second Corinthians 4, verse 7 to 10. And these are great words, words of encouragement that the gospel brings us in difficult times. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show you his all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. May that warm our hearts as we go through ups and downs, discouragements as well as encouragements. May we faithfully follow him that he comes again. Let us pray. Dear Lord our God, we, we pray wherever we're at tonight, whatever we're going through, that Lord God, that we will be able to come before you, to acknowledge who you are, even when we don't feel like it, even when we struggle with some of those concepts in our daily lives. God, give us the faith to be able to pour our hearts before you in humble submission. And in that, Lord God, may we walk in the silence. May we follow you even though we don't know why, even though we don't know how things will turn out. God, may we be seen as being faithful until you do come again as the great bride to the bridegroom. God may we long for eternity. Where all our difficulties. All our tears. All our frustrations will be gone forevermore. And that we will reign with you forevermore. Just as we take some time. We just want to respond to God's word. We don't want to just go on to the next thing. It's very easy especially when you're at home. Just to go on to the next thing. And allow the impact of God's word to leave us. But we're going to have another item of praise from Leah. And please use this as a time just to process. And to bring some of that. Maybe some, bring some of your brokenness before the Lord. Thank you Leah.
the words of the benediction. So if you do know them, um, join alongside me. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now, now and forevermore. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Uh, keep safe. If, if you have anything uh, that we can help you with, please do contact Aaron or me. Maybe if you've got a question of the sermon or maybe you want Bible reading notes or any other things you need, please do contact us. Thank you.